Just a little uh, announcement uh, regarding the children's story. I love doing children's story, and uh, there are some great ones out there. And I know you guys think you're children, but oh, we do have one child. Okay, well, come on up, young man. We'll get the children's story. Um, so I just went up there and changed the slides. Can you go back? Just use the back arrow, please. Uh, no, back. Just use the back arrow to the left, the one that goes to the left. But show the slide so I can see where we are. Yep, yeah, go back, please. Back, back. Just use the back. How are you? Good. Have a seat. Yes, very good. That's, that's great right there. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's strange, the whole plan around. Sorry about that. Uh, what's your name, young man? Johnny. Johnny. We have Johnny up here today. Johnny, long before they had computers, these were the computers. And people would use them in different ways. And as you can see, there are different types of people. I will call them computers. Let's consider every pencil is a type of person. Okay, that's what I want you to think of. So, of course, you see there are some people who are just normal. They do what they can. Then there are others who just don't make any mistakes at all. They just work and work and everything is fine. Then this one with the two erasers, what kind of people do you think those are? All they do are make mistakes. So they need the erasers to take care of all those mistakes. Okay. Uh, then there are those who do very little. That's what that second to last one is. They do very little. And then the last one, what do you think that stands for? People who do nothing at all. So we're talking about different types of pencils today. I saw this on the internet. It's called the parable of the pencil. And I, I changed it around a bit if you don't mind. But I want you to think, Johnny, each one of us is a pencil. And there are five things each one of us need to do as pencils. Okay, what do you think those five things are? I'm putting you on the spot. I'm going to give you the answers in a moment. So here are the five things each of us need to do. On every surface, wherever you are, you need to leave your mark. Because a pencil, when it writes, leaves something there. So you are important enough that you need to do something special wherever you are. So you leave a mark that people know, hey, Johnny has been here. One of the things you need to do. Secondly, you need to know that every mistake you make can be erased or fixed. Every mistake that you make. Now, sadly, though, Johnny, I must warn you of that, that sometimes when we fix those mistakes, it may take a sharpening experience, which can be a bit painful. You know, when you watch that pencil get all that extra lead, oh, it must be painful for the pencil but it makes a pencil better. So even though you make mistakes and you strive to erase those mistakes, God can bless you because he will use that sharpening experience to make you a better person, a better Christian person. Then, you have to remember this. The most important thing about you, Johnny, is what's inside. You may someday grow to be seven foot four, be the best basketball player in the world or best hockey player in the world or best football, whatever, or best doctor, or surgeon, or lawyer, whatever. But what's really important is what is inside. What God puts inside of you and makes you special in his sight. That's what's most important. So don't worry about what people tell you about how you look, or how you act, all of that is important. But what is most important is what is inside. Because if this pencil has no lead, what good is it? It may look cute. You can hand it in your hand, you can hit your younger brother or sister. Oh, I didn't say that. But you can do so much with that. But without the lead, with nothing inside, it's no good. And the last thing to remember, you will be able to do many great things, but only if you allow yourself to be held in the hand of the master. Because this pencil, again, does no good unless it's being used. And there are other people in the world who will tell you, no, let me tell you what to do. Let me tell you how to act. Let me tell you how to speak. Different singers or actors, whatever, they try to tell you how to live. But God is the only one you want to tell you how to live, Johnny. God is a master. 
that you want to leave your pencil in his hands so you can be everything that God wants you to be. So will you remember that? Every time, do you even use a pencil? Have you ever used a pencil? So every time you use a pencil, remember that you are most special in God's sight. It's about what's inside of you and leave your mark so others will know because of Christ, you are who you are. Let us pray. Father, we pray that you'll bless each one of us to be pencils in your hand. Especially we ask that you bless Johnny, that he will give his life to you. He will leave his life in your hands so you can do many great things through him. And by your grace, we will forever be your children and we will live with you soon. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Margita suggested I could take off my jacket. Uh, and I had to tell her, I have to go to work after, and I cheated, and I wore a t-shirt that has writing on it. So if I took off my jacket, you'd see Canadian, what does it say there? Oh, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, it, yeah, I don't want that emblazoned in your minds for the rest of your lives. Yeah. Say again? Yeah, that's yeah, no, right. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to be in trouble. Uh, so if we could put the slides on, because uh, I'd like to share this song with you. Uh, the fact of the matter is, friends, that we serve a great God. And because we serve him, we have the hope of so much in our lives. So because he lives. And by the way, if I start coughing, I'll stop and sing again, what have you. But uh, I've been having some fun with that for the past few weeks. But uh, nothing contagious, just, just the end of a cough.
we'll sing probably one more song and we can just take those two down just a bit. You know which ones they are? Not right now, not right now. On the board itself, the PC audio to your left, the board. <laughs> okay, we're just pushing them all the way. Yeah, Luke couldn't be here. There's a PC audio, just down just a notch. Not, you see where it is? If not, that's all right. Was it too loud for you guys? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay, no, no, no. <laughs> Okay. okay, we'll leave it as it is. We'll leave it as it is. Our scripture lesson today is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes as king and all the angels with him, he will sit on his royal throne. That's our scripture lesson. But before we get into the sermon, we do want to wish you people who happen to be Canadians. Anybody here not Canadian? Get out. No. <laughs> I didn't know you were not Canadian. Are you American? No, but both. Don't you have both? Are you? Oh, really? I never knew that about Pam. I am a landed She's a landed immigrant. So we can get rid of her anytime. No, we won't do that. I didn't. That's one thing. I, you know, we learn something new all the time. My wife is both. She has both. Okay, well, we want you to stay. So happy Canada Day to you all. Uh, I, I just thought, you know, it would be interesting to do a survey about what people think about Canadians. And there was one done by CBC years ago. Uh, if you want to spend some time looking at all the answers about how Canada is perceived around the world. And I found about 10 that I was going to share with you, but I didn't want to take the time. So I'm going to give you two of them, what they said. The Dutch are attracted to down-to-earth Canadian spirit. In Amsterdam, many locals will play dumb if an American asks for the way. But state you're Canadian and doors will open instantly. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, Pam, you must enjoy that, right? <laughs> you better not go to Amsterdam. I say you're a landed immigrant from Canada. Yes. And then this person says, we need to recognize what is in fact Canada, a wonderful, free, and democratic country with a strong economy and wonderful people. Wherever you go in the world, my friends, people know about Canadians. Probably because of how Canadians act when they go to those countries. When I was in Japan, I had emblazoned on the back of my jacket three symbols of Japanese. Ka-na-da. So when I was walking around in the winter, everybody, oh, Kanaji, no, they were so friendly. That's how it was. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, and I thought it very interesting, if people around the world like us because of how we act, could you imagine what that parlays into to us as Christians? People will know Christ by Christians, how Christians act, how Christians treat them, how Christians are. That would be an interesting experience, I think. Our subject today is a better day is coming. A better day is coming. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word that we can open today. And we pray that your spirit will bless our hearts with understanding, that your spirit will give us your mercy, and we'll feel at rest and at peace this day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. A better day is coming. Uh, do you have that paper? How about the young? It's up there. Uh, we found out this morning... that a loss has been taken in our church. My good brother lost his son this week. And uh, it's been a strong struggle for him all week, we can tell that. Roy, his son was Roy. And this is what Armand has written. The morning of Monday, June 25, 2018 at 3 a.m., I was praying to God that he would lift the burdens and the pain of my son, Eric, my sister, Pat, and all my friends, family, and myself. It felt like a 2,000-pound truck was sitting on my chest. I was crying out to God and was saying to God that I believe you can remove mountains in people's lives. I was wondering at this time why you didn't remove the mountain in Roy's life, and God said he did when he took him home. Then I said to God, he's my child. And God said to me, he's your child while he was on earth, and now he's with me, he's my child. We are all God's children and God showed me Roy's legs and feet and how much he was suffering. 
And then I see Roy beside God, and he was smiling. And the heavy pain that was on me, God lifted it from my heart. I felt very happy for Roy and very peaceful. I thank God for his love and understanding. I will miss him very much. Amen. Let us pray, my friends. Father, we do ask that you bless our mind in the loss of his son, Roy. We thank you for the promise of a better day coming. We thank you for the promise of the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the opportunity we will all have to live forever with him. So bring peace and comfort to his soul, and bless each of us that we will be faithful, so that when you come again, we will go to live with you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. A better day is coming. I have the opportunity to be with you guys for three Sundays this month. So whenever I have that opportunity, I like to uh, do a series. So we're going to talk about parables. Uh, now, if you have a parable you'd like to hear a sermon on, if you can switch it to the computer, please. If you have a parable you'd like to hear a sermon on, please let me know. Don't wait till the 22nd when I'm here, <laughs> but let me know sometime. You can either let someone, uh, somebody in the staff know uh, this is a parable we'd like to hear. So whatever parable seems to have the most, we'll do that. If nobody responds, by God's grace, we'll choose a parable. Today, we're going to look into chapter... Thank you. Today, we're going to look into chapter 25 of Book of Matthew. And there are quite a few parables in this chapter. There's a parable of the ten young women, which has to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ. The parable of the three servants, which has to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Do you see a pattern here? And then the last of them is the final judgment. And I like to call it the parable of the sheep and the goats. So that's what we're going to spend some time looking at today. The parable of the sheep and the goats. Matthew says, When the Son of Man comes as king... <laughs> when the Son of Man comes as king and all the angels with him, he will sit on his royal throne, and the people of all nations will be gathered before him. Then he will divide them into two groups, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. That's what it says about the judgment that God is going to sit before he comes again. Because God knows what's going to happen, but we still need to learn why. So we have the parable of the sheep and the goats. I don't know if you realize this or not, but the sheep, or a sheep, or sheep, the word sheep, is found some 240 times in the Old Testament, some 43 times in the New Testament. Goats, on the other hand, is found some 93 times in the Old Testament, some six times in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, when you think of the sheep, it was a sign of wealth, a sign of power, a sign of your ability to take care of things. But ultimately, what was it used for? A sacrifice. So in the Old Testament, the sheep was ultimately a sacrifice pointing to the ultimate sacrifice, which is Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, Jesus often uses the term speaking about sheep and shepherds, where he says, so Jesus, I am telling you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. So not only was he the gate for the sheep, but he was also the good shepherd who was willing to die for his sheep. Trying to get an understanding of why he used sheep so much, he goes on to say, I'm the good shepherd. As the Father knows me and I know the Father, in the same way I know my sheep and they know me, and I'm willing to die for them. Throughout the New Testament, we hear stories of Jesus looking for the lost sheep. And I love the artist who decided to paint some of these sheep as black, right? We call the black sheep of the family not always the best thing. I don't take it personally, but uh, <laughs> that's how it is. And then the fact is it says that the sheep know their shepherd's voice, and they follow him wherever. Then we see pictures of Jesus carrying lambs. Now, I have never been a shepherd, but uh, I prepared a sermon on the 23rd Psalm. And one of the things a shepherd will do if there's a lamb that strays away a lot, 
he will break the legs of that lamb and carry that lamb until it's healed. And that lamb will never leave his side again. And I thought, man, that sounds cruel. But it's really what's going to save the lamb in the long run. He could just break his legs and leave it to die. But that's how God is. As I said, even in the children's story, sometimes that sharpening experience doesn't feel so comfortable, but his ultimate purpose is to save us. So yes, he carries a lamb within his arms. But ultimately, he was the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So the story again, the parable is about separating of sheep and goats. And I don't know how they got these to take a picture that they both look like they're happy to be with each other. Smiling away. And the peoples of all the nations will be gathered before him. Then he will divide them into two groups, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Any of you know much about sheep or goats? Anybody ever had them? There's some interesting things you want to know about sheep and goats. Some differences and some interesting aspects. Sheep are docile. and What do we call them? Dumb sheep. Because they'll follow their shepherd blindly. Wherever he takes them, he'll follow them. I'm told goats are full of personality. They're really smart. They always, always want to be as high as possible, or at least higher than anything else. My wife used to have some goats, and when her mother would come to visit, the baby goat would run up grandma's legs and try and get all the way up here and hang up on top of her shoulder just to be at the highest point. So we could spend a lot of time talking about all of the differences between sheep and lamb or sheep and goats, taxonomy, their foraging behavior, physical differences, horns or not. But the bottom line is, and no pun intended, is that they are different. Then I found someone who said the easiest way to tell the difference between a sheep and a goat is to look at their tails. Did you know that? A goat's tail goes up. A sheep's tail hangs down. Basic. So if you ever want to know the difference, look for their tails. Then it says, he will put the righteous people at his right hand and others at his left. Then the king will say to the people on his right, come you that are blessed by my father, come and possess the kingdom which has been prepared for you ever since the creation of the world. It is interesting to me that some will use this text to talk about predestination, that no matter what you do, you, you will either be saved or lost. God has already decided if you are going to be saved or lost. God knows who's going to be saved or lost because he's God. Any of you ever watch a child in your house and I, I, I feel so horrible, I was going to be a horrible grandparent and show you videos of my child making, our grandchild making some choices, but the video file isn't working here. Too bad. Anyway, I was going to do that. But if you watch a child in a room and there's a glass on that table, what's that child going to do? You know the child is going to do that, but do you force that child to do that? Do you tell that child to do that? Do you predestine that that child is going to do that? And the funny thing is, when they start walking to that glass and you say, stop, no, they look at you, you know what, I didn't do anything. <laughs> because they haven't done anything yet. So God knows what's going to happen, but he does not force, coerce, because he wants us to choose him, because we want to choose him. So the fact of the matter is, when God separates the two, He's letting us know why. When God judges mankind, it's not because he needs to know, but everybody else needs to know. Because the devil is going to blame God of being unfair if God saves somebody the devil doesn't think should be saved. What is the story of Job? God says, have you considered my servant Job? And David said, well, he's only nice to you because you are nice to him. God said, okay, let's test that. And sometimes God tests us in that way. Are we good to God only because he's good to us? Do we love God only when he's loving to us, it seems? Or the moment things go bad, we say, God, forget you. That's the parable of the sheep and the goats. 
So then he goes on to say, I was hungry, and you fed me. Thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you received me in your homes. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. In prison, and you visited me. All these things are what made the sheep on the right-hand side. The ones that God said, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Now there are some people who will say, it doesn't matter what you do, God will do what he's going to do. God doesn't care what you do. Yes, he does, my friends. Because that's how he has to judge for the world to see, is by what you have done. So don't think that, well, okay, it doesn't matter what I do, God is going to, no. It does matter what we do. We're not saved by what we do. Understand that. We are not saved by what we do. But by God's grace, when we have received his salvation, then we need to be different, don't we? I cannot tell you, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, I love God, but then I punch you every chance I get. That doesn't seem to go together. Oh yeah, sure, I'm a Christian, but I'll cheat on my taxes anytime I want. It doesn't seem to go together. I'm a Christian, but the minute you cross me, boy, I'm going to get you back. It doesn't seem to go together because a Christian lives a life different because of the love of Jesus Christ in their heart. So the, yes, the sheep are told, you are the righteous ones because of what you have done. But then the sheep says, wait, when did we do that? The righteous will then answer, when, Lord, did we ever visit you, feed you, clothe you? When? Jesus will say, I tell you, whenever you did this for one of the least important of these followers of mine, you did it for me. So guys, when you're nice to other people, just think. Just think. So next time somebody cuts you off in the line at the grocery store, pray for them. Please, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Or they cut you off in traffic, be careful what you lift your hand to do or say because the way we treat people tells us if we are in a relationship with God or not. Don't worry about what it tells other people, but it should tell you if you are in a relationship with God or not. That's in a nutshell the parable of the sheep and the goats. God is going to say, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. I want God to say those words to me when he comes again. Because a better day is coming. No question in my mind, a better day is coming. There are enough parables that talk about that. If the owner of a house knew the time when the thief would come, you can be sure that he would stay awake and not let the thief break into his house. So then... You also must always be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you're not expecting him. There are some who will say, well, it'll happen, nobody will know, but the Bible tells us clearly that we will know. Sure, comes like a thief in the night, meaning some aren't looking. Some are not expecting. Some are not preparing. Our church got broken into a few weeks ago. And if we knew somebody was going to break into the church, we'd have had somebody sitting there at 2 a.m. on a Wednesday morning. When a thief comes, no one knows. And God says his coming will be like that. Because those are not looking for him to be there. Not looking and preparing for him. Listen, Jesus says, I am coming soon. I will bring my rewards with me to give to each one according to what? What does that say? according to, read, what he has done. God is going to reward us according to what we have done. Not to save ourselves, but because we are in his salvation, according to what we have done. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Happy are those who do what? Wash their robes. Then say, have somebody else wash them for you. Wash their robes. 
But God gives us that clean robe. Then we have to choose to put that on. We have to choose to put that on. We have to choose to do something with that robe so that you'll have the right to eat the fruit from the tree of life and go through the gates into the city. That's a parable of the sheep and goats that our Lord wants us to be prepared for his soon return. The disciples watched as Jesus was taken up into the clouds. And they wondered, what would happen to us now that he's gone? But he promised them that he would come again. The angels told them, in the same manner that you see me going up into the clouds, that's how he will come again. Jesus is. my hope for each one of us that we will be in the sheep on the right hand side of the Father so he will call us to be blessed of him for eternity we will now sing our hymn of response 560 O Master let me walk with thee 